The AIDS pandemic is one of the most serious crises the world has ever faced. Since the beginning of the epidemic, more than 60 million people have contracted HIV, and nearly 30 million have died of HIV-related causes. Both my mother and father died of AIDS when I was really young. I also had to watch my brother die of AIDS. It was slow, painful, and awful. He was the one that took really, really good care of me when, after both my parents died, and I really miss him. With close to 34 million people in the world now carrying the HIV virus, and an estimated 2.7 million people newly infected each year, it's clear the world has not figured out how to stop this disease. So why, despite the billions of dollars being poured into AIDS prevention, have infection rates not significantly decreased? Dr. Edward Green, while director of the AIDS Prevention Research Project at Harvard, set out to answer this question, and the international community did not like what he found. If sexual behavior is changed in the direction of more monogamy and fidelity and more abstinence, it greatly brings down infection rates. In Dr. Green's book, Broken Promises, How the AIDS Establishment Has Betrayed the Developing World, he says the research shows that the sexual rights approach to AIDS prevention, championed by the UN and Western donor countries, may actually be increasing the rate of infections, not bringing them down. And if he is right, millions have died unnecessarily. When I was a young girl living in Mozambique, a documentary was made about my brothers and I because both of our parents died of AIDS. Meu pai morreu em 2001. Passando algum tempo, 2002, morreu minha mãe e nós ficamos órfãos dos pais. Não tinha nem mãe nem pai, ficamos sozinhos. Passamos por um momento muito difícil, ficamos só sozinhos em casa. Era uma pessoa que queria e E vivemos, vivemos sem pai nem mãe. Sentíamos muito, ficava muito triste, ficávamos humilhados, né? Por ver outros com mãe, não é sem mãe, sem pai, pá. É tristeza para nós, né? Many of the people who got involved in AIDS prevention initially in the US were were gay men themselves or were working in that community. And uh, it almost sort of grew out of the gay rights movement. Most Africans have conservative attitudes towards sex. My own personal attitude happens to be more the liberal one. Most of the people who work in AIDS prevention adhere to a liberal attitude towards sexual behavior. When we're talking about vulnerable populations, we're talking about, um, among others, gay men in injecting drug users and MSM. Dr. Jonathan Mann, an American physician, is widely credited with organizing the United Nations worldwide fight against AIDS. He placed the struggle to end discrimination against men who have sex with men into the very foundation of global AIDS policies at the United Nations. The historic significance of Jonathan is emphasis that we have to embed the uh, response to AIDS in a human rights approach and not in a classic quarantine type of approach. He really set the tone for the years to come. President Obama issued a directive to all U.S. government agencies that engage in international activities to make advancing LGBT rights a top priority. We have done more in the two and a half years that I've been in here than the previous 43 presidents to uphold that principle. The Obama administration defends the human rights of LGBT people as part of our comprehensive human rights policy and as a priority of our foreign policy. For us, family stands at the heart of everything we do. We live for the family. Gay rights are human rights and human rights are gay rights. We do not want any discrimination against anybody under any condition whether sexual or otherwise. But we have to state clearly and forcefully that this concept stands against everything we stand for in Africa. And because we have rights, governments are bound to protect them. 
The issue of sexual orientation in the United Nations human rights system has not yet mustered consensus. All the previous attempts to integrate sexual orientation into existing universally recognized human rights have not been successful. Recently, there was an announcement um, both by, the, by David Cameron and uh, by President Obama that you know, they, they are willing to cut off aid to countries who do not recognize LGBT rights. No, we want to object to that as just being manipulation. Don't write manipulation to get us to accept something, a lifestyle which is um, proven to be scientifically unhealthy, a lifestyle which is contrary to the religion and cultures of most of our people. We take great objection to this type of manipulation and we wonder if the American people are aware of what is happening. Okay, so what we're seeing is the LGBT agenda being pushed uh, in, 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 you know, like a carrot stick for aid money. You want aid money, then you must uh, change your laws. These issues of gays uh, and uh, transvites, transsexuals. This is a new form of imperialism, I must say. And it's surprising that the American you know, government is at the forefront of that imperialism. What is amazing is that these countries that are har harassing us, smaller countries, in these countries, the rate of HIV AIDS among um, the homosexual groups there, um, typified as MSMs, that, that rate is increasing and not only so, it is said to be out of control. This is recorded in the scientific journals. The U.S. Center for Disease Control openly admits that Although men having sex with men represent only 2% of the U.S. population, they account for approximately 60% of all new HIV infections and are 44 times more likely to be infected with HIV. And finally, they admit that men who have sex with men are, quote, the only risk group in which new HIV infections have been increasing steadily since the early 1990s. Why then would they want us to accept this type of lifestyle as being a healthy and wholesome lifestyle? One has to seriously question the intentions of President Obama and the other presidents um, across the world. People are saying because we, we have criminalized uh, the LGBT um, activities, we, we do not have good governance. What is governance? In the United States, the states that allow sex, same-sex marriages and the other states that don't allow same-sex marriages. That's democracy. People have chosen. The people in those particular states have determined and the majority have spoken. It's deception. There's no human rights based on behavior. All people are equal, but not all types of behavior are equal. That's blackmail. And uh, it's blackmail on a moral issue, on an issue that uh, you, we are, you know, you, we're forcing governments, African governments, now to go into the village and explain to that people. You're getting money to build that borehole. You're getting money to you know, bring water or electricity into your community simply because you're now going to allow uh, Jane over here to marry Mildred over there. We stand against violence to anybody in, in the community. We really we stand against violence. At the same time, it does not mean that we have to accept the lifestyles of others. I'm not saying that I am a, you know, that I don't like uh, homosexuals or lesbians. Or I, I love them. They're my brothers and sisters. And, but I do not love or do not like what they do. But what we are emphasizing is that maintain your way, of, your way of life while we maintain our own. Well, the end result will be deconstruction of what we, of the family system and the family structure in Jamaica. The third and perhaps most challenging issue arises when people cite religious or cultural values as a reason to violate or not to protect 
the human rights of LGBT citizens. It's against Christian values. And we take, you know, our Christianity differently. It's not like you put on a coat and you can take it off at night. We are Christians through and through, and that's Christianity. We adopted from, you know, the very same people now who are coming in and saying, um, we're not giving you aid money. It usually starts, from what I've noticed, it starts with the repeal of the anti-sodomy laws, but it doesn't stop there. Once these laws are repealed, it gives, it then gives opportunity for, for persons to demand other rights. For they get to the point where they d demand marriage or civil unions. Then it gets to the point where um, churches, uh, there, there is a demand for these unions to be solemnized in churches. You know, it gets into the educational system. It gets to the point of where criticism of the lifestyle then becomes an offense and people are fined for, for this type of thing. And to come in and to say, we must change our laws, it's actually to come in and say, what we told you about Christianity, what we told you about uh, Islam is not true. Then it, the Bible maybe has to be changed in this case, because it's in the Bible, and we were told it's in the Bible, there's no witchcraft, you shouldn't have uh, more than one wife, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that and homosexuality is wrong, uh, lesbianism is wrong, a man should not be dressed like a woman. Now to come in and say, we have to change. What platform really are we on to say that we must change? Once you say anything remotely critical of the lifestyle in these countries, there is a problem. And so I'm concerned for my own country, which is a highly religious country, you know, I'm concerned about the, the impact that this could have on freedom of speech. I believe countries have got a right to protect themselves, to protect their citizens from these influences that are not of Africa, that are not of our communities. I was shocked to realize that some months ago in Pakistan, the U.S. the U.S. ambassador there announced uh, gay party, you know, a party for all local homosexuals. I felt that that was an affront to the Pakistani people. And I just wondered how insensitive could, how could one get, you know? Isn't that just a total disregard of the culture of a people? In 2011, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education issued a report to the UN this report claimed that children have a right to comprehensive sexuality education that, among other things, will abolish guilt feelings about eroticism, include homosexual education, and make students aware of their sexual rights, such as the right to sexual pleasure. It's about starting when we're with children about the expectation of, of, of roles, and we need to start there. My brother Luigi and I had an opportunity to go to the United Nations and give a speech on the UN floor. First, my brother explained about how we became orphans when both of our parents died of AIDS. We were able to go in closed United Nations negotiations where we saw developed countries trying to force the African countries to accept comprehensive sexuality education. This kind of education tells youth they can have fun and have sex and just use condom. This kind of message was a death sentence to not only both of my parents, but also my brother Rogerio. I went to the United Nations with my brother and sister. It was, uh, it was called the High Level Meetings on AIDS. So much talking, when all they had to say was, don't have sex outside of marriage. That would save hours and hours and hours of work. Then it was my turn to speak. I told them how Planned Parenthood was passing out a booklet for HIV-positive youth at the United Nations called Healthy, Happy and Hot. Can you imagine? This is for the kids who have AIDS. The booklet says its purpose, and I quote, to support your sexual pleasure. It tells youth they can have sex in different ways. It teaches about sexual pleasure through masturbation, with same-sex partners, and even if you are drunk. 
The first time I came to the, to the United Nations was around 1999. And I remember very clearly, I had made some speeches at the United Nations. And I had no idea that when I was calling for comprehensive sexuality education, that it was about pushing the sexual rights movement. In his speech to the International AIDS Conference in August of 2008, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called for the decriminalization and destigmatization of homosexual sex. However, there is no evidence that destigmatizing or decriminalizing the sexual behavior of high risk groups decreases HIV AIDS rates. My brother Luis was also invited to speak at the UN about AIDS orphan. But then he found out that the African group was being pressured to endorse a document pushed by UN AIDS called Guidelines on HIV AIDS and Human Rights. Do you know what the guidelines say we have to do to stop AIDS? They say you have to legalize same-sex marriage and graphic sexuality education for kids and legalize prostitution. My brother showed the delegates what the guidelines really say, and they removed it this time. But the rich countries keep pushing to endorse this in other documents. UNAIDS published and circulated an email which was false and malicious ab about me because they felt that they needed to have in the document language relating to men who have sex with men and sex workers. As a result of the pressure that UNAIDS put to bear in this email, CARICOM's negotiating position was changed. And I was advised that my contract would not be renewed. They actually said that for us to combat HIV and AIDS, we needed to legalize prostitution, legalize homosexuality. It is an affront to the principles of the UN Charter, a UN agency should not be allowed to overstep its bounds in such a manner. We are so arrogant. We Western technical experts. So here's this great model in Uganda. The Western experts show up. They know what's best affecting gay men and drug users. And they go to Africa, maybe with no experience in Africa, and tell them what to do. And they don't listen. And they don't notice what's going on around them. Because there is a great divide between the developed countries and the developing nations. Many of us are still not even food secure, you know? We can barely feed ourselves. The poverty rate is sky high. You tell me how funding to educate people on men having sex with men, you know, or the lesbian agenda is going to be beneficial to my people. It's not. Uganda has received international acclaim for its fight against HIV AIDS and the fact that this came from the highest political level through our president, His Excellency Yoram Seveni. Our approach is gradual. Abstinence, be faithful to each other, but if you can't, use the condom. We had to fight to defeat AIDS or it would defeat us. My husband believes in our culture so much and our culture really used to, to always uh, promote uh, abstinence from premarital sex. Uganda is our family and we had to spread that message to everybody. It is ABC. When Uganda launched their ABC program, they had no way of knowing that they were no longer fighting HIV only, but also the ideology behind Western AIDS prevention. Uganda is now very concerned that its success is being eroded by criticism leveled against it, that it's not laying enough emphasis on the use of condoms and, on, and should actually reduce its message on abstinence and being faithful to one's partner. It could be said that the small African country of Botswana represents one ideology in the AIDS policy struggle and that Uganda represents the other. In 1990, Botswana had a prevalence rate of only 3%. In 1992, it rose to 10%, and in 2011, it reached an alarming 24%, the highest in the world next to Swaziland. In 2015, 
more infants are expected to die of AIDS in Botswana than are born in Boston and Philadelphia combined. Let's compare Botswana and Uganda. In 1990, Uganda had one of the highest HIV infection rates in the world with a rate of 15%. Then, in 2006, Uganda's infection rate took a dramatic drop to only 5%, one of the largest reductions of new infections ever recorded. The way it worked in Uganda was probably just about right. You had President Museveni going around from town to town with a bullhorn, literally telling people, uh, you've got to change your behavior or you're all going to die. And if you're really going to do something stupid anyway, at least use a condom. That's probably about the right message in a place like Uganda or South Africa or Botswana, where a large proportion of the potential partners you're going to run across are HIV infected. That is the truth, and that is what you ought to be telling people. Infection rates are going up in the U.S. Huh? They're going down in Kenya. They seem to be going down in Ethiopia now. They went down in a major way in Uganda. They went, they went down and stayed very low in Senegal, and yet we're going to these countries and telling them how to prevent AIDS. People say, we have poverty and we have women not having choices in their lives and then there's this huge disconnect and therefore we have to go with condoms. What sense does that make? These women who have no choices and no power, do they think they're going to get their husbands to use condoms with them regularly? Today, you know, a condom isn't something that a woman can in many, 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 most situations negotiate. And so we have to look for prevention tools. Condom use in steady partnerships is not even in the double digits anywhere in the world among heterosexuals. Anywhere in the world. I could see where he was going, but a part of me could not stop. It felt so good to be loved. And he asked for sex. And I thought, I don't give in, I'm going to lose this guy. The good news about condoms is that they are an effective product. The bad news is they're not 100% effective. They had to take a blood test. It was the worst experience I ever went through. I was shaking all the way. I said, God, if I have AIDS, I'm finished. And I came so close to the fact that I could be HIV positive. I just lost a friend, 21 years old. I saw her in the last stages. She had full-blown AIDS. It was so scary, so scary. Who among us has not heard somebody say that uh, you can only get HIV from unsafe sex? Well, that's a statement that condoms are 100% effective, which just clearly isn't true. The way we do AIDS prevention, which could be called risk reduction only, you're, you know, you're reducing the risk but not avoiding or eliminating the risk. If you're uh, a young person in South Africa, even if you're using condoms consistently, if you're in a situation where a third of the potential partners you're running into are positive, even with 90% protection, there's a substantial chance that after several years you're going to get infected anyway. Which countries in Africa have the most condoms and use the most condoms? Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, those countries stand out. And they don't have lower infection rates, they have higher infection rates. We put that data into a table that shows the, as, as condoms become more available, instead of infection rates going down, they actually rise. The use of condoms is what we believe is the cause for the slight increase that we have seen in, in the infection of AIDS, HIV. And this is because it lets um, our population believe they can let their guard down and they can actually behave in risky behavior because of the uh, belief that these condoms can actually prevent AIDS 100% and that is not true. I'm in no way opposed to promoting condoms uh, as part of a strategy for AIDS prevention. The problem with condoms is if we let that give us the illusion that we can forget about the A and the B. If you're a young person in South Africa and you've got the message drummed into you that AIDS prevention equals condoms, you think you're protected and therefore you don't examine your underlying behavior and stop to question whether 
having multiple partners in the middle of an AIDS epidemic uh, is totally insane or not. You know, you can use the analogy of seat belts and drunk driving. It's not a bad idea for them to wear seat belts. The, the problem comes in when you have the illusion that as long as you wear seat belts, it's okay to keep driving drunk. A meu pai ficou doente quando nós estávamos em dez de agosto por muito tempo. Sentia-se mal quando nós viemos ele doente. Pensávamos quando ele morrer, vamos ficar com quem? Quem vai nos sustentar? Sempre andávamos triste. Mais tarde, ele acabou por perder a vida. Quando ele perdeu a vida, também ficamos desesperados. Porque... Ficamos por três meses na casa, sem teto. Eu brincava com meus amigos. Às vezes, meus amigos, quando eram chamados com a sua mãe, ele respondia a mãe. E eu não tinha mãe para poder responder. Então, eu ficava assim, um pouco mais triste por não ter mãe. Nós não tinha ninguém para poder chamar mãe. Right now, nearly 40 million people are living with HIV. The annual cost of getting treatment to everyone in the world who is HIV positive will be more than 13 billion a year, every year. Moreover, these figures assume no increase in the total number of people who will need treatment. Yet we're averaging over 4 million new infections a year. In other words, for each new person who got treatment for HIV, about 10 people became infected. If we don't increase our investments in prevention, um, how can the world afford, from a humane perspective, from a moral perspective, from a financial and economic perspective, that every year between four and five million people will become infected? The cost of promoting the ABC program the way Uganda did it in the early years when they broke the back of what was then the world's worst epidemic and turned that epidemic around, it was less than 50 cents per person per year. Not only is there this sort of general indictment that, uh, you know, we have violated trust and betrayed the people of the third world and everything by letting our ideology get in the way, but um, we, we have pushed Uganda away from the model that's worked so well. If you go to Uganda today, the emphasis is on drugs, it's on condoms, testing. The old ABC program that put real emphasis on A and B that involved the church, went into the schools, it's been largely dismantled. People accuse the religious right of being willing to let millions of Africans die for their beliefs. Well, unfortunately, in a sense, some people on the left are willing to let millions of Africans die because they don't want to say anything that sounds like they're interfering with their sexual freedom. Uganda has also recently come under heavy attack and criticism about its policies on homosexuality. And I think a lot of it is based on misunderstanding. Coming from a country where we have seen our loved ones die from HIV AIDS, seen the suffering, the toll that such illness bears, not just on the affected individual, but the family, the society, our whole economy is suffering. And it is our deepest uh, belief that we owe it to our fellow Ugandans to put the right policies in place. And homosexuality erodes the very, very fabric of our society in the sense that it puts our people at risk. Dr. Rand Stoneburner, he worked for the World Health Organization and he was all immersed in the Uganda data. But Stoneburner said that uh, history will look back on this period and say one of the great abuses of the latter part of the 20th century is a failure to do AIDS prevention in ways we know are effective. If we learn anything from Uganda, then what these nations look like in the future will be decided by the choices their young people make today. But I'm not a virgin anymore. What's the point? I could just go on after all. I've lost it. I couldn't know about secondary virginity. I say I may have lost the first part. I can keep myself from now till marriage. If young people decide, and many have against premarital sex, and they know that abstinence works. And they are proud to, to speak about it these days because they know that their lives are different. I was tempted, I tried it out. 
it wasn't what I thought it was. I wanted more and more to get what I thought I wanted. But I realized the greatest sex comes when someone really loves you. And if someone loves you, then they want to be committed to you. And that is only in marriage. I am definitely not going to have sex outside of marriage. Because first of all, I don't want to die early, and I don't want my wife to die early either. She's probably going to be really pretty, and she's going to be the mother of my kids. Not everyone is having sex, I realized. That's the thing, that everyone is doing it, but that's not true. And I'm not everyone, and you're not everyone. We could stand out of the crowd. I would tell the rich governments to stop pushing sex in Africa. And I would tell the African governments to not listen to them and to stand strong because no amount of money is worth it. Please act now and go to standforfamily.org and sign the petition to stop cultural imperialism. Let's unite with people across the world and stop the abuses exposed in this film.